My name is Melissa Fratkin. Um, Rich Richard waved at me earlier. I'm the secretary of ICSPUG. Um, I do wanted to. I do want to say because I don't. I don't think Richard said it that um, we are coming up on the two-year anniversary of those of us who are on the board, Richard and David and I, uh, and um, Thomas Steinke from Germany. And so if any of you would like to be officers and help run uh, the ICSPUG organization and plan these meetings and talk to people and do all of this kind of stuff, please do volunteer. Um, feel free to send me an email. Um, you can actually send an email to info at ixpug.org and that'll get to me. Um, but we would very much like to have you participate. Um, we do have a pretty big steering committee and some of those people will be rotating out as well. So if you'd be interested in being an officer and participating, we would love to have you. Uh, okay, so that was my pitch. Um, without further ado, um, back from his recent trip to Europe, Rick Steves, I mean, no, wait, Rick Stevens. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was funny. Um, Rick Stevens is gonna talk about something completely um, orthogonal to uh, Xeon Phi's, uh, but using them, I gather. Uh, so we'll hear about some science that's going on in Argonne as opposed to some technology. So, off you go. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. Well, occasionally when I am traveling, they do think I'm Rick Steves when I'm making the reservation, <laughs> and they upgrade me, and then I show up, and they're like, what? So I'm gonna talk about um, a couple of uh, projects that are um, kind of in the early stages that uh, are relatively new topics for DOE uh, to be involved in. They're both joint partnerships with the National Institutes of Health, and they're both problems that have a huge uh, need for uh, parallel computing. Uh, they both have uh, a lot of uh, places in the problem solving kind of tool chain where uh, machine learning is being applied and where um, we're quite interested in using Xeon Phi to accelerate these, uh, these elements of the workflow uh, as well as the simulation component. So let me try to tell you uh, what's, what's happening in these spaces. So there's a lot of people contributing to this. I won't go through the list, but uh, the BRAIN project has, uh, is really owned here at Argonne by Bobby Castori uh, and his colleagues at Harvard. Uh, Jeff Lichtman and, and uh, Hans Peter Fisker. Um, the Cancer Project is a four-way lab collaboration between Argonne, Oak Ridge, Lawrence Livermore Lab, and Los Alamos, and I'll, I'll walk you through that as we're going. Um, uh, a few months ago, this was an article that came out in the uh, Physics Today, I think, um, trying to explain uh, why cancer, brain research, and supercomputing were linked. Um, and it kind of decodes uh, a little bit what's going on, but the, at a very high level what's happening is the White House over the last few years has created a number of national initiatives, and all three of these initiatives are uh, linked in various ways. So there's the National Strategic Computing Initiative, that's also known to some people as the Exascale program, that's the program, the multi-agency uh, effort to uh, invest in next generation computer hardware and software, uh, new computing models like neuromorphic computing and quantum computing and so on, but also to uh, push forward on conventional architectures as hard as, po as, hard as, as, as possible. And DOE owns that component uh, focused on developing exascale systems. Um, there's a precision medicine initiative that the White House announced a couple years ago that's a pan uh, NIH initiative to move forward on the idea of using personalized genomics and other uh, detailed molecular assay type uh, information about individual patients to drive therapeutic choices, uh, and that has a sub-program in cancer called the Precision Oncology Initiative. Um, and then there's the BRAIN Initiative, and the BRAIN Initiative, um, again, is an NIH-led uh, uh, but multi-agency initiative uh, to push forward in understanding uh, the brain, develop new therapeutics, and so on, and, uh, and I'll walk you through how these things are tightly coupled. Um, one of the things that you might have heard about was uh, earlier this spring, uh, Vice President Biden announced uh, this thing called the Cancer Moonshot. So Cancer Moonshot is a, uh, again, an all of government uh, uh, initiative trying to increase by a factor of two or double the rate of cancer research. So the idea is to do 10 years worth of research in, in five years. And critical to this uh, concept of the Cancer Moonshot is to bring high performance computing to cancer research. So I'm gonna talk about cancer for 
kind of half of my time and brain for half the time. So first, a little bit of a tutorial on cancer. So um, this is a normal cell cycle. Um, when your cells in your body are, when you, and when you are an embryo and growing to an adult, um, your cells differentiate and they divide and they're under a uh, very complex uh, programmatic control of when to differentiate or when to divide. Uh, but a normal healthy uh, tissue in your body, most of the cells, not all of them, but most of them are in this kind of steady state uh, uh, cell kind of phase where they're not growing, they're not dividing, they're doing their function. Um, and uh, they respond to signals, but they mostly don't respond, uh, that mostly not signaled to grow. Um, there are various uh, signaling systems in uh, mammalian biology and, and non-mammalian biology that um, uh, can respond, can control cell growth. So there's uh, epidermal growth factors, EGF, there's uh, other types of growth factors. And these things basically uh, carry out a set of signaling cascades or uh, switches essentially that determine uh, what a cell is going to do. Um, and I won't go into the biology here, except that um, many of these signaling cascades have at one point in the chain uh, a, a signal that gets transduced through a protein called RAS. Um, and RAS is a protein that's in every single one of your cells. Um, it's embedded in the cell membrane. It responds to these uh, growth signals and it modulates a set of downstream signals that ultimately uh, tell the cell whether to divide or to differentiate or somehow to proliferate. And um, this cell signaling set of pathways are fairly complicated. I mean, this is a picture I've, I've circled just in blue, um, the kind of pathways that lead to uh, proliferation or cell division or differentiation, which are used in development. But it turns out these pathways also go awry in about 30% of cancers. And at the heart of those 30% uh, of cancers that have a defect in this pathway is mutations in the RAS protein. Okay, so you don't have to understand what any of this means except that there's this one protein present in every one of your cells. 30% of cancers have a mutation in that one protein. And what those mutations do is they turn that protein on. So it's an oncogene, it gets permanently turned on, you get undifferentiated growth, proliferation, okay, and that's a problem. If we had a way to just drug that molecule and turn it off, we would have uh, potentially effective therapies for a lot of cancers. And so just keep that in, in mind. Uh, it, it'll make more sense in a second. So about, a, about two years ago, the Department of Energy the National Cancer Institute started having a set of meetings um, that were focusing on this idea of were there uh, grand challenge problems in the precision medicine initiative in cancer that could be accelerated or advanced by coupling to high performance computing. If you go inside of NIH today and you look around, you don't see supercomputers. In fact, you see computers, but you don't see big supercomputers. You don't see big Xeon Phi supercomputers. You don't see any supercomputers, okay? The, the biggest machine that NIH has um, is one of the smaller machines that we actually have in our machine room. So th there's a orders of magnitude disparity of the amount of computing that the National Cancer Institute and the cancer research community have access to versus, say, state-of-the-art computing in DOE labs. And so there was this notion that if the DOE could partner with NCI, two things could happen. One is that NCI could gain access to some of the world's most powerful computers and maybe more importantly, the people that think about how to solve problems on those machines. But at the same time, DOE would be informed about a new class of problems that aren't like the problems that we normally work on. Okay, they're not like solving PDEs. They're not like um, you know, nuclear reactor design or climate change. They're very different problems and that we might learn from trying to solve those problems what features future computer architecture, architects need, uh, need to include in future computer architectures to make them more general purpose. And so that led to this idea of a, cent a joint project called the Joint Design of Advanced Computing Solutions for Cancer. And here's this really, that's a horrible name because you can't remember it and it doesn't have an acronym that you can pronounce, but uh, we just call it the UENCI Partnership. Um, and that's always, a good, that's always a sign that you've got a bad name for a project when somebody uses a different name. 
Um, but there's this uh, kind of goofy logo that shows the two things feeding back. And this was uh, presented back in uh, last December to the Secretary of Energy and uh, the NCI director, uh, Lowy, and they blessed it and said, go forth and do this project. And what's in this project are three pilots, three pilot activities. They all involve the four laboratories. The first one is focused on cancer biology and on tackling that RAS protein problem. And um, the idea here is to really understand the molecular pathways that this RAS protein is involved in to try to figure out how we can develop drugs that maybe we can't drug the RAS protein itself, but we can drug the downstream pathways to try to manage the cancers that uh, mutations in RAS uh, are involved in. So that's part one, it's at the molecular scale. Part two is building uh, a whole series of predictive models for preclinical screening. So preclinical screening is where you have big robotic uh, laboratories that are testing hundreds of thousands of compounds for anti-cancer activity on hundreds or thousands of cell lines or tumor types. And what we're doing in this project is we're gathering all of that information over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of compounds over dozens of different kinds of cancer, hundreds of cell lines to build predictive models that would allow us to um, better uh, choose compounds for which to do downstream therapeutic development. And I'll talk about that one in some detail. That uses a lot of machine learning, uses some deep learning, it uses uh, uncertainty quantification. Um, and the third one, so that this one, so the preclinical models operates at kind of the cellular level or the tissue level. The third one is cancer surveillance. So in the US, like many developed countries, we have a national cancer registry. If you get cancer, you're automatically in this registry. It's a law. It's like an infectious disease that's required to be reported. And it's partially because the government annually gets a report on the incidence and prevalence of cancers to try to understand whether there's environmental factors or whatever, but it's a right to know kind of a thing in the US. And so you don't, there's no privacy issues about this. If you have cancer, you're in the database, okay? About 30% of those patients are in a deeper database that can be mined uh, to understand trends and patterns. Right? And so this is called the cancer surveillance system um, and it's population scale analysis. And in this project, uh, most of those cancer records are text files, text objects that say pathologists or radiologists have dictated. Uh, you have this you know, cartoon in your head, somebody's looking at some cancer image and they're speaking into a you know, blah, 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 cancer, cancer and it ends up in a text blob and it goes into your medical record. Well, the problem is that that's very difficult to compute on these text records. So this project is about using large scale machine learning to essentially read those text records to produce structured data that we can compute on and we can build population level simulations to understand um, say treatment trajectories, right? Um, or uh, patient outcomes or things like cancer recurrence under different treatment scenarios at, at a population scale where N is like a million as opposed to individual hospitals where it's in the tens or, or hundreds. So on this uh, first problem, I, I talked about the RAS thing earlier, but this is a, uh, so these are all kind of like techie circuit people here, right? Because you're thinking about Z on fly. So I'm showing like a circuit diagram of a cell, okay? So this is, should be uh, somewhat uh, comfortable for you to look at. So these are the block diagram of the different modules. These are genetic modules, uh, protein modules in the cell. And this RAS uh, MAPK module, uh, MAPK is a, a kinase module. This is one of the key uh, signaling uh, components. And it's that uh, system that we're trying to understand. If we double click on that module and look at everything that's connected to RAS, okay, you get a diagram something like this. So RAS is that thing at the top and it flips back and forth between two states bound to GDP and, and uh, uh, GTP. Um, and it has some helper molecules that actually forms a complex, a multi-protein complex. And it has all these downstream activators, uh, uh, RAS, uh, TCK, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And there's all these downstream streams that are actually telling the cell what to do. This is one of the reasons why this is a really uh, challenging 
uh, thing if you get a mutation in that RAS because it affects so many pathways in the cell. So our challenge is to figure out how can we use large scale computing to compute these interactions at the molecular scale to try to learn how it works so we can learn where to stick uh, drugs. So the basic idea, I've told you this already, 30% uh, of cancers, uh, this 30% represent about a million cancer deaths a year, um, and there's currently no effective therapies for these RAS. We have um, structural information for part of the molecule. Um, we uh, have a, there's a little movie up here. I don't know if I've got the file plugged in. I don't know if it'll work. Yeah, there you go. That's RAS uh, dynamics in a cell membrane labeled with a fluorescent protein, and you can see these are very dynamically things. They're moving around. There's, every one of your cell has kind of thousands of copies in it. We got a lot of supercomputers. Um, what we're doing in the middle is developing a series of um, dynamic molecular dynamic simulations that are multi-resolution. And I think I've got some more uh, slides on this in a second here of how this is going to work. We also have um, a, a lot of uh, uh, experimental capability to deal with RAS, which I think I've got in here in a slide. So the, our colleagues at the National Cancer Institute have these devices they make called nano disks. They're about uh, 10 nanometers across. So they're basically a patch of a membrane. They can artificially bind RAS proteins to it and they can shove them in microscopes, electron microscopes, et cetera. So we've gotten a lot of information that way. We can do cryo-EM, we get the clustering. What we're doing on the simulation part is building an molecular dynamic simulation that can do traditional uh, atomistic simulation. It can zoom in and do a quantum version on a subset of the problem, and it can zoom out and do coarse graining. And the basic strategy here is to wander around this pathway uh, space here. Okay. We build simulations that include uh, multiple components on this chart using the molecular representation. Molecular dynamics computes some basic properties of this, and then we decide then to uh, stage a series of runs based on the data coming from the initial runs, and the decision on which runs to do next is made by uh, unsupervised machine learning that's looking at the trajectory space of the simulation and deciding whether it's saturated the state space of this particular set of molecular interactions and when to move on to the next state space and what resolution to do that. So this idea is a, a large scale loop of hundreds or thousands of simulations. Each of these simulations runs on you know, thousands of cores or thousands of, of, of nodes. Uh, tens of thousands of cores, um, and uh, has a specific uh, configuration, a specific starting point, a specific code, and a time frame. We gather that information, we run it through the machine learning to essentially encode it in some small number of states, small number of, of uh, you know, the large state space gets encoded into a small number of states, and then we look at how well we're searching the overall interaction space to plan the next move. The next move is uh, done automatically by the computer, sets up the next run and continues. So this is, think of this as machine learning driven simulation. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a new paradigm um, and uh, it has at its heart large scale machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, and of course large scale multi-resolution molecular dynamics. So that's pilot two. Um, in, or what we call pilot two, it's the first project I talked about. The second project, high throughput screening, is trying to attack this problem. 50% um, of patients don't respond to typical chemotherapy for some tumors. Now, it depends on the kind of cancer you have, but let's say you had colorectal cancer, right, colon cancer. Um, only about 50% of the patients respond to chemotherapy. And one of the failure modes is that your cells become resistant to the drug after a certain period of time, and you have to increase the dose to have some effect, and at some point you can't increase the dose due to toxicity of the compound, right? That's the whole, whole problem. So one strategy is to initially try to match the tumor with a specific drug that's going to be most effective on that tumor. Um, and that's this idea of precision medicine that is characterize the tumor at a molecular level, gene expression, mutations, and so forth, and then use machine learning to predict based on historical data which drug is gonna be most effective for that specific 
type of tumor, the specific genotype that you have. So if you do that, you can get an increase in uh, survival, increase in effectiveness, but you still have a problem that 50% uh, of the population is, is not going to get any response. Another idea is to combine drugs. So have a chemotherapy drug with an immunostimulation drug, a drug that stimulates the immune system to also attack the tumor, to help clean up the tumor. And again, there, not all of these immune drugs work on all tumor types or on all patient genotypes. And so we also want to use genetic information to decide which, say, immunostimulation drug to give and to which pair uh, to give. Now, one of the challenges in cancer is that it's not a single, even a one tumor is not a single homogenous uh, type of cell, okay? So this was an experiment done a couple years ago. This was a single tumor from a kidney, I think, um, and uh, it was about three centimeters across, and each one of these little circles was a micro punch that took out a little bit of, of tissue and then they sequenced that little uh, micro punch with a tissue. So there was a couple hundred of these punches on here. And so one tumor was sequenced like a hundred times. And then we looked at the mutations uh, in each one of those samples. And what was discovered, first of all, is that there's a lot of diversity in that tumor. You could reconstruct the cell lineage from like the original cell and all the diversity. But the second thing that was discovered was that while most uh, cancer researchers have been assuming that cancer um, is under evolutionary pressure, that is, it, it is as cancer uh, tissue grows, as tumors grow, they're competing with the normal host tissue and with each other to survive, and therefore, you would expect a tumor to be very homogenous in its genetic makeup. You'd expect the non, the less fit cancer cells to die out, and you'd have kind of a single population of very fit cancer cells. Turns out that, in fact, this analysis showed that this is not happening, that there is not, uh, at least in these initial large-scale tumors, uh, Darwinian selection going on. It's very neutral. This thing had over 100 million mutations in the one tumor. Now, why is that important? It means that this was a, a key uh, result that underpins this idea of why cancers become drug resistant. So what happens when you treat the cancer with a, with a compound is that you will kill maybe 90% of the cells. Okay, so imagine, you know, of these, say there's 100 of these dots, there's more than that, but say 100 of these dots, 99 of them go away, that's the only the cells that are left, but those are more fit and they continue to divide. So initially, maybe the tumor will be uh, reduced in size, right? Maybe even to the point where you can't detect it anymore, and then some period of time goes by and, it, and you have a remission, or I mean, you have a, a, a reoccurrence of the tumor, but it's now genetically different than the one you started with, right? More resistant to the drug. So that's, that's an important result. It means that even in small tumors, there's gonna be the possibility of a large amount of heterogeneity that gives rise to drug resistance. And so that's a real problem. So one of the strategies is not only to take chemo chemotherapy type drugs and uh, immunostimulation drugs and combine them, but to take two existing drugs, say chemotherapy drugs, and to combine those. And combination drug therapy is being used, has been used for a while in antibiotic uh, context and in infectious disease for the same reason, because we get resistance in infectious disease. We think that same strategy can work here in cancer. Um, the NCI is just in the middle of completing a study where they took over uh, 100, 100 small molecule drugs that are licensed for cancer treatment. Most of these are, are um, chemotherapy type drugs. And uh, screened those against 60 different um, types of, or 60 different cell lines, about uh, 15 different cancer types. This results in about 300,000 experiments. And when you do that, so it's about 5,000 combinations. Right? It'd be, it'd be 10,000 if you did 100 by 100, but you only have to do half the matrix because you know you got you know, A and B is the same as DNA. Um, and uh, if you start plotting the uh, growth of the tumor under this combined drug treatment, um, I think you can move this laser where it's here. If you look at this plot here, these lines that go up are the size of the tumor over time. Okay, so this is bad. This is about as good as uh, 
you did one drug, it, but in a few cases, pairs of drugs get this result down here. That is, together, they're way more effective than using one drug. And this is because of this kind of synergetic effect, synergetic effect in fighting resistance, we think. So one of the uh, issues that we're trying to do is use uh, machine learning to essentially learn the relationship between the molecular characteristics of the tumor and the, the molecular properties of the, say, drug combinations. And so far, we've got results that are pretty good. We can, uh, about 89% accuracy, we can determine whether or not the combination is up here or down here that would allow you to again, take it to further screening. Um, so that's a, you know, that's one direction that we're going. Another thing that's happening is that there's a, this idea to build proxy models for each patient. Okay, so what we mean by our proxy models? Well, let's say I have, I don't know, I have colorectal cancer. I don't, but, and I hope I don't get it. Um, but they would, uh, when they diagnose it, they would take a, uh, a sample, a biopsy, right, some tissue. Maybe if I had surgery, they would, they would take a resection of that, ha have some tissue. From that tissue, they can do some uh, chemical reprogramming of the cells and uh, hopefully induce a cell line that will grow in a dish. That can be used in high throughput screening, like I talked about with hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of compounds. But you can also take that uh, sample and you can transplant it subcutaneously under the skin in a mouse that's, uh, that's an immune suppressed mouse. So it's a mouse whose immune system has been knocked out so it won't fight the tumor. So we're using that mouse as a carrier to grow the tumor, a human tumor inside a mouse. Okay, so it's not a mouse tumor, it's a human tumor grown inside a mouse. Um, and you grow these mice, uh, you might plant it in five mice, you grow it up to it becomes uh, maybe a centimeter or so, then you take it out of that mouse and you transplant it into additional mice. So for each uh, original tumor, we would grow up like a colony of like 100 mice that carry my tumor. Now, the advantage of having a set of mice that are carrying my tumor is we can do experiments on those mice that can't be done on a person, right? So for example, we can do a random clinical trial of a new compound on those mice, uh, hopefully with a tumor that still closely reflects that of a patient, right? So that's great. Um, of course, it takes about a year to grow up that colony of mice, and of course, that's a long time to wait. Um, but one of the reasons of having that colony is that we can build these colonies for hundreds of different types of cancer or hundreds of, of different patients' cancers, dozens of types. And we can do drug trials in those colonies. And we can then take what we learn from the way the mice uh, tumors are or the mouse-hosted tumors are responding to build into predictive models that would then say, if you have this type of a tumor or you have this genotype, this drug is most likely work for you. So it gives us a way to build up that database. So that's the project that I'm, I'm leading uh, in this big scheme. Um, at the top, so we have a lot of data coming from uh, information about uh, chemistry, tumors, uh, screens that have already been done, uh, all kinds of data associated with uh, the cell lines and from the mice models, as well as more basic biology information, cancer pathways, biochemical pathways. Uh, data that's already out there, like the Cancer Genome Atlas or the Cancer uh, Data Commons. Uh, this is petabytes of data. Um, so at the top, we're building uh, machine learning models that learn the relationship between the, the uh, molecular characteristics of the tumor and the drug response. We do it in cell lines. We're doing it in PDX models. We're taking it from not just single compounds, but pairs of compounds. Ultimately, we'll have a model that even for a new compound that's never been screened, we would attempt to make a prediction whether or not it would be effective in, in, a, in a patient. But we're also very interested in optimizing the way NIH does experiments. So while they have a large budget, they're doing lots of experiments, they don't have a mathematical framework for choosing the next best experiment to do. So we wanna put uh, uncertainty quantification and optimal experimental design wrappers around their experimental protocols just in the same way that we do in other experiments in engineering, to say if you're gonna test some material, do this, do this, as you explore the parameter space, we wanna do the same thing for these drug responses that allow us to build better and better models. And ultimately, we wanna couple them with actual uh, pathway information. So not only can we get predictive results that we get from machine learning, 
but we also get kind of uh, explanatory results that say why that model might actually be uh, trustable. And that means that we're building models that have to bring in drug properties, so uh, digital fingerprints of the drugs, structural information of the drugs, target of the drugs, as well as um, all this information about the cell lines that include things like gene expression profiles, mutations, proteomics, um, image data if we have it. As a deep learning formulation, uh, as a cartoon model, it would look something like this. You have molecular characteristics of the tumor at the top. These are data that are being collected now in these research labs, but at some point that kind of data would be collected routinely clinically. Okay, it would characterize deeply your, your tumor. And then we have information about the drugs, the drug target or the molecular action on the drug target, these descriptors which can be derived from the structural formula of the drug, um, structural fingerprints that measure different uh, distances inside of the structure and other physical properties. And then we train a network on pairs of these things, or if it's a case of uh, the drug pairing, we'd have one tumor type and two drugs. And then we, the typical networks have you know, half a dozen hidden layers. They're really wide at the bottom. They have, in fact, we're working on some that are over a million, have a million input values. And on the output, it could be a number of things. It could be predicting that drug response in that tissue, or it could be here's a, a set of drugs, what's the order in which the physician should try this drug, first line, second line, third line. Okay. That's the goal, and we're making good progress on that. Um, ultimately, we want to combine, this is from uh, uh, Russ Altman out at Stanford, you know, we have this information about the cell, we can build two kinds of models now. We can build a mechanistic model that tries to explain the biology, and these are quite informative at individual molecular pathway level but we can't integrate them to make a predictive model at a system level yet. They just don't work. They're not complete enough, essentially. If we can use machine learning, we can get very high predictive accuracy. Some of the models are 99% accurate in terms of predicting the you know, data they haven't seen, but they don't explain what's going on. And ultimately, we want to couple these things so that a physician or an insurance company or a drug developer not only would um, have the result, but they have some reason to believe the result. So that's where that's going. Project three, please. So I talked about cancer surveillance. Uh, US and Europe are almost 100% in these registries. The developing world is less so. One of the reasons that you want to have this data is that it allows you to, um, it allows you to look at things like trends, right? So here's a, a chart in terms of uh, survival um, rates uh, in cancer. So the US, you have a little bit higher survival rates here, uh, trends in cancer spending. Of course, we spend uh, $68,000 on an average cancer patient. EU spends a little bit less. I don't know how much this is due to that, but it gives you some sense of the trends, right? Um, right now, um, we can see these large uh, scale trends in terms of the number of new cases of cancer, number of deaths, right? Uh, Right now, in the U.S. anyway, it's about a you know 67% chance that you would survive five years to have cancer, um, and so uh, you know this is pretty amazing that we have this large-scale information. But what we want to be able to do is do modeling and simulation at this large population scale. So we have in these records pathology reports, molecular profiles, and a few of them reports from say radiation treatment or chemical treatment how effective that treatment was, whether there was a second or third line of treatment, what the overall outcome was, uh, was it survival and you know, remission or elimination of the cancer, was it death, how long was it? Um, and so this database now has all this information and it has it uh, down at the level of you know, individual reporting zones, which are typically medical centers in the US. So we have this data at a very fine grain for the whole US. And the project here, so led by Oak Ridge, <coughs> is to um, essentially mine these clinical reports um, using uh, deep text comprehension. This is deep learning on text um, and comparing that to classical uh, natural language processing methods to pull out essentially um, tag parts of speech and to build a structured database on which we can then build agent-based models to understand these overall trajectories. Um, and uh, this is this is already on in progress. Uh, some of the large-scale agent-based models here 
are the kinds of things where you might simulate a million cancer patients under different treatment scenarios to try to understand whether a given treatment strategy is more effective or less effective, or is it dependent on where you live in the country or your demographics or your uh, genotype and so forth. This overall cancer effort is a project between DUE, National Cancer Institute, and various companies, including Intel, um, as well as universities at Harvard and Chicago and, and others. Um, and, uh, and we're starting to bring in pharmaceutical companies. And uh, you know, it's, it's really getting off the ground this year. Um, one of our large scale goals is to figure out um, what we have to do in the future to build machines that are really good at large scale numerical simulation, you know, typically characterized by solving big PDs, um, but also bringing in scalable data analytics and deep learning. So the, the framework that we're interested in for the future is capabilities in the machine that equally support all three of these uh, ways of doing science. Um, one of the ways in which we're going about that is uh, just announced a couple of weeks ago, um, the same group that's working on these pilots partnered together for an exascale computing project award called CANDLE. CANDLE stands for Cancer uh, Distributed Learning Environment. Um, and it's basically taking the common machine learning component to these three cancer problems and pushing forward on a software infrastructure that will be scalable to exascale that supports all three learning modalities that we need. And I'm the PI of that. Okay, so that's cancer. Let me talk about brain for a while. How many of you have a brain? Okay, not very many. Okay, you're here to sleep. How many of you are, how many of you think your computer is smarter than you are? Yeah. All right. So one of the challenges we have um, in neuroscience is uh, trying to understand, uh, try to understand how brains work, how to understand how nervous systems work, maybe how they evolve, um, not only at the gross level, but at the molecular level, at the architectural level. Um, and so this effort, uh, again, there's a brain initiative in the US um, that's been going for a couple of years that's really targeting this. And the reason that this is kind of compelling is that uh, in between your ears is about 100 billion neurons. Um, you have about, um, let's see if it'll bring up, you have about 100 trillion synapses. Actually, you probably have a little bit more than that. Um, and uh, if you were trying to build a map of the brain at that level of resolution, where you traced every single neuron, every single synapse, that would be about uh, a zettabyte of, of information, which is roughly comparable to the amount right now of the annual internet traffic. So if we added up the internet traffic across you know, all the inputs and outputs on the internet, it would be about the volume over one year of what it would take to have this uh, brain, uh, ma brain map. So this is clearly not gonna happen anytime soon, um, but it's one of these kind of mega uh, grand challenges. So um, in 2013, Obama announced this thing called the Brain Initiative. Um, and uh, the Brain Initiative stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neural Technologies. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, so this initiative uh, had a lot of uh, political support. It still, still does. Um, it's a pan-agency initiative in that it's uh, supporting research not only at NIH but NSF and other uh, institutes. Uh, the high level goal of this initiative um, is to first of all map the circuits of the brain, the kind of static circuits, the dead brain if you want to think of that. Then to map how electrical patterns uh, fluctuate and, and uh, originate and flow through the brain, electrical and chemical activity. Um, and then how to uh, you know, try to understand how the combinations of these uh, dynamic and structural properties result in emergent cognitive behavior and behavioral capabilities and so on. And one of the things that's interesting about the U.S. initiative, because the Europeans have an initiative that's somewhat related to this, is that the U.S. initiative is taking a very basic biology approach. So not only are we trying to study the human, we actually want to understand how brains evolved uh, in many other species, right? All the, you know, starting with invertebrates and working our way up to, to vertebrate brains. Um, the other kind of logical argument for this initiative is that um, they're trying to draw a parallel to the human genome program. Okay, so the human genome program took about 10 years, 
about three, four billion dollars. Um, and it, it laid the technological foundations for much of modern approaches to biomedical science. It kind of transformed how we do biomedicine. Right? So they're looking for something similar in neuroscience, that is a, taking a very technological approach that would create a new set of databases, a new set of instrumentation that would change fundamentally how we approach uh, brain science uh, and brain disease, including things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, PTSD, you know, beha uh, behavioral uh, anomalies and so forth, right? So the um, argument, you know, pushed further was that the genome program had a huge ROI, right? The, the current analysis is that the genome program created a, you know, $140, whatever, for every dollar that was spent uh, in terms of massive impact. And so the idea is maybe the same thing can happen with the brain if, if we do it right. Um, so it's going to go after what are the new cell types, or what, what are the cell types, um, lots of different brain maps, um, get this dynamic activity, um, how does activity relate to behavior, what are the underlying properties, you know, what happens in humans as opposed to, you know, insects, right? And then taking that information and translating it into, um, into medicine. So there was a little bit of a challenge as this got launched over the last couple of years. There was a, uh, this scientific uh, roadmap, this planning document, and uh, uh, it was, it's a very well-written document, but it had some challenges. Um, you might think that if you're gonna build something that is, uh, you know, billions and billions of, of uh, bytes large, you know, zeta bytes, that you might have a few computer scientists or mathematicians in the conversation, and they basically didn't. Um, um, in fact, the, in, out of 146 pages, I mean, computer science was mentioned five times and math was mentioned four times. So part of the challenge here is bringing the math and computer science community and the physical science community much in closer uh, contact with, uh, uh, with the neuroscience community to try to uh, correct this, right? Uh, if this initiative keeps going over the years, it would have a large budget profile, uh, investments in technology, investments in neuroscience. Um, it's spread out around the country. Um, right now there's, uh, this is like a couple years old, but you know, it's a couple hundred million dollars a year going into this uh, currently was budgeted DARPA. DARPA is mostly focused on uh, kind of returning warfighter that's been damaged and trying to fix them uh, in some sense. Um, the NSF program's got a very basic uh, science in it. Um, one of the challenges here is that the brain, to understand the brain, there's many orders of magnitude in uh, spatial and, and temporal scale. So you've got, you know, a typical brain's about a, you know, liter, liter and a half or so, order 10 centimeters, and uh, you've got a morphological structure at a centimeter, you've got uh, large-scale neural structures that are kind of order millimeter, you've got dendritic spines that are kind of 100 you know, micrometers. Um, if you look at slices here, you take dial all the way down to a synapse, where you have these uh, little molecular pockets that are actually uh, vesicles that are turning on and off to do neural signaling, and these things are down at the submicron uh, level. So if we want to actually build a brain map, we have somehow have to build up from this very fine grain imaging uh, that we can do in electron microscopes up to some large scale structure. So the typical way this is done is we have some uh, animal, um, often a mouse, it could be something else. Um, you resect the brain, uh, you then use a uh, a diamond knife uh, that I'll show you a picture of that can slice extremely thin slices, less than like 30 uh, nanometers thick. Um, you then, uh, and you get thousands of those, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these slices. Um, you then have to uh, use some kind of automated image acquisition, typically a multi-beam electron microscope. Then you have to uh, register each of these slices into a 3D stack. That's a hard problem. Uh, there's a deep machine learning problem in the middle of that one. You need to then uh, segment uh, and detect the features, and then you produce from that uh, structures that you can then uh, compute the network topology or the, the physical geometry on. So um, this is a, a schema of the diamond knife machine. 
Uh, so sitting right here is a frozen section of that mouse brain. This is a micrometer that's going back and forth um, with a thin diamond knife on here. This thing is very cold. Um, it pulls off these slices. These slices, again, are like 30 nanometers thick. They float on a little water bed and stick onto some Kapton tape. This is Kapton tape courtesy of Apollo, right? It was invented to heat shield uh, or wrap uh, things. Uh, it's thermal sensitive tape. That tape um, is electrically neutral. Um, we have to coat these things. Uh, I should say that the brain is actually fixed in a plastic uh, uh, when it's, and it's dyed and fixed in plastic. So we have these thousands of slices. This is what the tape looks like. Um, these things are fed into an automated imaging machine that's plugged into a stage of an electron microscope. Um, this is a, uh, there's people, this is Lichtman, this is Hans Peter, uh, other, this is a guy from Zeiss, happy guy who just sold the machine. Uh, these are about $5 million a piece. Um, so this is the big electron microscope. This particular one has 61 parallel beams. Okay, so 61 emitters, lots of complex magnets. And so it scans kind of in lockstep in 61 places that are in a, a hexagonal tile. So it generates about 12 terabytes a day. It can run 24 by seven. So in six months, gets about two petabytes of data. Um, the center here that we're working on, we're planning for about 50 of these microscopes. Um, it would be about $250 million. So it would be about the same price as a supercomputer. So it's kind of a partner device. Um, and uh, the new ones have 91 beams and they produce about, uh, if we scale up, the facility would produce about a petabyte a day of these imaging. Even so, um, it would take many years to do a, br a human brain. I mean, longer than we, we could wait. So we would run this as a user facility that would image many different kinds of brain circuits for many different kinds of neuroscience people, but the facility would produce about 320 petabytes per year. Um, so we would need more than the storage that we have in Aurora if we wanted to expand this up in the near term. Um, but it produces images like this, these are raw images. Each one of these patches is, comes from one of the beams um, and uh, you get a slice, okay? And we stack these slices up and then we have to segment. So what segment does is it means we need to identify in each slice the chunks of the image, the region of the image that belong to the same 3D structure. Okay, and that's actually a hard computational problem. Um, here, uh, Bobby Castori, who's the neuroscientist here, um, spent uh, for this one data set spent uh, about uh, I don't know year and a half using this tool to hand segment that go in like a, it's like kind of an adult coloring book application, right? So you click, assign a color, click, assign a color. Imagine doing that for like two years, right? Just, okay, basically hand labeling the training set. And then, and then uh, Hans, uh, uh, Hans Peter Pfister's group trained a deep uh, neural network on that training data and then applied it. This is the validation data set here. I'll play the music again. I can get it to play. And so it does pretty well. There's a few places where it, it screws up, but this is a, a very challenging problem. Um, the idea is to eventually build up a network, train a network that would be better than any human at doing this and a lot cheaper and a lot less likely to get bored um, so that we could do that at scale. Uh, here's you know, some little tiny features that you probably didn't notice that it got wrong. Um, now, the particular thing that they took about two years to do um, is less than a is it less than a cubic uh, micron, uh, a cubic, uh, yeah. Well, it's a little bit more than a cubic micron. It's, it's uh, 150 cubic uh, microns. Here's a, a kind of a picture. Uh, the this piece here is a is a punched out kind of round slice. It's actually two punches. This is over a dendritic uh, spine here. So this is one uh, kind of macro uh, neuron. But here's what the uh, object looks like, um, I can play the movie here. So the colors here came from the segmentation, hand segmentation work. Um, in order to kind of bootstrap the database for Connectome, this is just exploding it apart, not just translating the, the pieces apart, um, and trying to identify the different types of neurons, different types of structures, helper uh, cells inside this uh, system. 
so you want to build a database that uh, identifies the different classes of parts. Um, so axons, helical cells, astrocytes, et cetera, dendrites. You've got axons on one side, dendrites on the other side. Um, so this gives you some sense of the catalog. Um, we're also experimenting with using x-rays here at Argonne. We have a big x-ray source. And this is a x-ray tomography on a comparable cylindrical punch uh, piece of brain uh, tissue. Um, and what you're seeing essentially in these white things are blood vessels because the current x-ray source can't get the same resolution as the electron microscope. So we're limited to things that are, that are uh, order you know, micronish. Um, and so you end up with a, if you apply a same kind of uh, transformational, I mean, the, the segmentation problem and so on for this, for each of those uh, slices that you get from the electron microscope, you can uh, reconstruct this structure, which uh, has blood vessels. Each one of these round things is a neuronal body, but we can't resolve the axon and dendritic uh, structures in that. So one of the things that you would do by uh, collecting this data is to post-process it into uh, a graph database. So this database uh, indexes each of the neurons that could be extracted from that small sample that Bobby had done uh, and produces a uh, graph topology of everything that's connected to that neuron. And this, this database links between these neurons. So it gives us a way to reconstruct the connectivity graph between the components. And you can zoom around in it, uh, kind of a dynamic database. The idea here is to dump all of this in, look for patterns in these substructures, and to use this information to parameterize large-scale computational neuroscience models so we can get a sense of the behavior of these kind of neural, neural circuits. So um, DOE is involved in this project because A, it's a big computing problem. Both the reconstruction is a big computing problem. It needs a lot of computation uh, to process the electron microscopy images, to reproduce or to reconstruct the three-dimensional representation, to do the image segmentation, to do the extraction of the graph topology, and then to use that to forward parameterize computational neuroscience models, which are also now starting to run on our large-scale machines here. Uh, the Blue Brain Project, based at uh, ETSL in Geneva, has got one of the early science projects on Theta, and they're doing large-scale neural simulation, taking data from the Connectome program to parameterize their models. And so over the next few years, we hope to kind of drive that into a, a closed cycle where we're uh, eliminating error in the large-scale model. So DOE is working on uh, interpreting dynamic data. This is mostly happening at Berkeley. Structural data coming from here at Argonne and other places, and then building uh, models and abstractions that would integrate this together. So with that, I want to uh, say, you know, everything I've talked about here has got support from lots of agencies uh, over time. Uh, lots of companies and so on, and uh, dozens and dozens of people actually work on it, and all I do is get to give the talk. So, so any questions? Uh, first, I'd like to say the very impressive talks, both, both brain and cancer. And on cancer talks, um, I have a question. When you run, uh, you said thousands of simulation, molecular dynamic simulation, and you showed movie of uh, RAS uh, dynamics. Uh, what's the total uh, size uh, of output data from these thousands of simulation, which we use for machine learning? So the machine learning is done on a sampled uh, set of uh, molecular traje or atomic trajectories. So if you think about molecular dynamics, uh, every time step, in principle, you can write out the coordinates of all the atoms, right? And these simulations have um, the lipid membrane, they have the actual proteins we care about, they have the small, uh, small molecules that are interacting with the proteins, and they have a water bath. So they're, um, 
you know, billions of atoms. Uh, we don't write out every atom. There's a sampling algorithm. And then, so the input to the unsupervised machine learning clustering is on the order of millions, but it's not, it's not billions. Um, and that the current strategy there is to uh, frame that as an autoencoder that's trying to uh, find a smaller states or kind of a smaller set of manifolds in which you can describe the, the overall trajectory information and then to use that to cluster states that are similar. So the, the whole purpose in some sense is to use the machine learning as a steering through the state space. Right? That's helping. Do you have a feeling that this model of DOE and NSF supplying computing cycles, whether that model will continue or whether NIH will eventually say, oh, we want our own stuff, we don't want to be in BART, you know, have other people running our show? So I was with NIH on Friday, and um, certainly the National Cancer Institute would love to get uh, big machines, but the kind of scale that they are thinking about is something about one-tenth the size of leadership machines. Um, partly because they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the staff, they don't have, I mean, it's a big operation. Um, so I think the uh, likely direction, though, is they will get more facilities, but they will be at that next tier of scale, and they'll still want to do some computation on the DOE machines. Um, but, of course, one of the uh, great things would be if they have, if they're this smaller version of the same architecture so that uh, all the development on the smaller machines can project up to the larger machines. Well, NSF's harder to say, you know, what NSF is going to do, um, but because this project doesn't involve NSF, it's really just the DOE and, M and MCI. How many core hours it takes uh, full simulation for a tensor uh, molecular dynamic simulation? Well, there's many different problems here, but it's, I mean, the kinds of allocations that we're talking about are kind of uh, half a billion to a billion node hours. So they're, they're huge, yeah. Per exascale? More broad. Well, yeah, so the, the question was, these are really good projects for exascale. What are some other projects for exascale? So, of course, in the recent announcement that DOE made for the exascale computing projects, I mean, you have problems in combustion, and material science, in climate, in computational chemistry, in quantum chromodynamics, of course, everybody has that, cosmology, uh, problems in uh, basically using metals for 3D printing, trying to get at the dynamics of, of 3D printing processes. Um, uh, let's see, what are some of the other ones? Uh, subsurface flow, whether it's uh, you know, water or hydrocarbon uh, subsurface. Um, We've got problems in genomics uh, related to, uh, say, mining out of, of metagenomes. Uh, there's a, a seed project on urban science, which is trying to bring uh, computational modeling to the problem of integrating transportation and energy usage in, in urban environments. So there's a wide range of, of problems. Um, maybe about a third of them are, are what we'd call non-traditional uh, PDE kinds of problems that have a large data as the fundamental challenge and therefore some form of data analytics is integral to the problem, whether it's machine learning or graph databases or other uh, algorithms that are really primarily uh, operating on pre-existing data as opposed to generating, you know, 
I'll pick later. Where's the question here? Okay, so I have one question. So, uh, what is the size of the research teams, and what is the structure? Seeing this, how many scientists and how many uh, computational programmers, and how they collaborate on developing all those simulation software. This problem, there's um, four labs. Each lab has about 20 people uh, involved in the project, but each project has people from each lab. So, um, the one here at Argon is that I'm leading is the um, high throughput screening or the preclinical screening one. So we have about on the order of 20 people from Argonne and another half a dozen from the other three labs that are participating. So each team is about 25 people. Um, at least that's the scale that we're, that we're operating. Uh, we don't quite have the budget at that scale yet, but that's where we're headed. Um, and uh, the pilots talk to each other all the time. The, the problems, there are some problems that kind of jump between pilots because the RAS cancers, for example, are ones that we're working on for drugs and they're also the ones that we can see in the surveillance. So that's one of the common threads. But because we have a need for common uh, uh, machine learning technology, we're all doing deep learning of some form in this. Um, and we want to do it on one scalable platform as opposed to each making an independent decision so we can share models, we can share hyperparameter optimization strategies and stuff like that. So, so I think, yeah, across the system, it's, you know, it's on the order of uh, 80 or 90 people. Okay, let's thank our speaker.